This is News 25 with Deanna O'Donnell. News 25, local news you can count on. News is brought to you by J.K. Nelson Law. Give them a call, 727-9900. News is also brought to you by Desert View Hospital. You can count on us. Welcome to KPVM TV and Ace Country Radio's News 25. I'm Deanna O'Donnell. Today is Monday, December 19th. Well, kidnapping and rape suspect Ryan Sanders was in court this morning for a probation violation hearing. Represented by attorney Jaherna Shahani, the defendant appeared before District Court Judge Robert Lane following his December 1st arrest. The wanted fugitive was captured after a 74-year-old female reported that she had been kidnapped, raped, beaten, and left for dead by Sanders and his alleged cohort, 31-year-old Richard Duncan. We have a report oh. file stamped December 2nd. Underlying is child abuse and neglect. Allegations are controlled substances, laws, and conduct. If he admits the allegations, we'll go forward with sentencing. If he denies the allegations, we'll set up for an evidentiary hearing. <clears throat> you and your attorney have had a chance to speak. What would you like to do, Ms. Shahani? I would like to deny the allegations. Additionally, I believe uh, some of the listed alleged violations are um, non-technical and some are technical, so I believe two reports need to be prepared. Uh, you faded at the end. So I believe two reports need to be prepared. Uh, the reports for technical violations and the report for non-technical violations. Is that accurate? Have you heard of that? Your Honor, I've never heard of that. Um, we go with what's most severe because all the violations took place within the same report. Once it rises to the level of non-technical, it becomes a non-technical violation, which in this case, due to the new charges that Mr. Sanders was arrested for. So you want an evidentiary hearing? Yes, sir. How soon can you be ready, Mr. Percival, for an evidentiary hearing? Can we do it after the first of the year? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Anytime by January 15th, I'll be ready. Okay. January 27th at 11 o'clock, evidentiary hearing. Police say on November 22nd at approximately 2.30 in the afternoon, deputies were dispatched to the 3,000 block of Malibu here in Pahrump for a report of an assault. Upon arriving, they encountered the 74-year-old female who reported an assault and kidnapping. Investigation revealed, according to police, that the elderly female resides in the 1,000 block of Enchanted Mesa. During the early morning hours on the 22nd, she was awoken by a male attacking her, now identified as Ryan Sanders. The female was subjected to repeated brutal attacks by Sanders, who also burglarized her residence. Sanders subsequently bound the female and loaded her into her own vehicle. She was driven to Desert View Hospital, where they picked up Richard Duncan and subsequently went to an abandoned RV in the 3000 block of Malibu. At the abandoned recreational vehicle, she was again assaulted and beaten and left to die. Police say that Sanders beat her with a fence post. The female was able to get free from her bonds and escape to a neighbor's property, where they called 911. Duncan was quickly arrested. Following an extensive manhunt, Sanders was located in a trailer on Elderberry Street with a female and his 13-year-old son. Sanders and Duncan's also stole both of the victim's vehicle and used them to transport her from the scene. One vehicle was found off Winsong and Basin Avenue. A person was arrested at that location for allegedly hiding the vehicle from police. It was determined at that time by police that Sanders' attack was based on revenge. He allegedly worked for the victim's son and was terminated. In the November case, Sanders is facing charges of kidnapping in the first degree, attempted murder, false imprisonment, burglary, grand larceny of a motor vehicle, attempted sexual assault, sexual assault, and battery with substantial bodily harm. He was on probation with a history of burglaries, vehicle theft, possession of stolen vehicles, child neglect, simple assault, possessing stolen property, theft, grand larceny, fraud, and controlled substance charges, according to the Nye County Sheriff's Office. Well, Director of Public Works, Tom Bowling, gives an update on the current road projects that are currently on schedule. 
Nye County Public Works Director Tom Bowling gave an update on upcoming road maintenance projects. The multiple projects in the DocuSign queue for approval, including including Dunes, Linda 372, Fox Boulevard, Flood Repair, all just waiting for approval so we can get started on those. Um, Basin Road Project, we are doing a kickoff next week. We're going to go and do a walkthrough and see exactly what we're going to need to do in order to be able to do the Basin Road Project. That would be improving from the Dolly intersection, which we will be improving all of the Dolly intersection and going all the way through Blag. And that would widen the road, make it a lot more uh, travelable by both the pedestrians, the bicyclists, and the traveling public. And uh, that would carry it all the way through Blag. Uh, last month, uh, Commissioner Cox asked us to look into the Whitney Road repave or w repaving Whitney Road there behind the park. Uh, we went through there and we decided that the best way to clean that up would probably be to pulverize everything that's there and chip seal it would be the cheapest way, fastest way to get it done. And we can do that and it would be sustainable for the next few years until we can come up with some money to repave that or anything else that we can figure out. Uh, Winery Road. Winery Road is on our agenda to get done. We are currently working with Helm, and I know you guys sat through their uh, spiel about the northern part of Pahrump and the flooding and stuff like that. We had them give us a proposal on what we might need in order to uh, control the floodwaters that go down Winery Road. And we're still trying to decide how we want to do that because that could be uh, remove and replace or it could be we have to put in storm drain down the whole street, which would be $100 million. And we don't have that much money, naturally. Homestead Road, we did install a sign and repainted the curb uh, in front of the source. Again, we Looks good. enlisted the the help of the contract of um, engineer to see what we can do about redesigning that whole section and putting in any kind of island if we need to put islands or if tearing that island out is the best option for us right now because of the amount of traffic that comes out of um, Maverick and the amount of traffic that comes out of that business establishment. Um, so it's we need to actually have a professional opinion on this. So that's we're waiting for them to get back to us on that. More from the Board of County Commissioners on the other side of this break. You're watching News 25, the most recognized and farthest reaching local news in Nye County. News 25, local news you can count on. This segment of News 25 is brought to you by Lisa Spahitz and Mike Plasmeyer at Country Financial Insurance. Auto, home, life, and commercial. 775-727-8920. Also brought to you by Battleborn Financial, investing and health insurance made easy off Pahrump Valley in Calvada. Well, the Board of County Commissioners spoke recently about reimbursement from the state for ICE inmates in the Nye County Detention Centers. The county is seeking funds through the Bureau of Justice Administration in the amount of $24,517 for the purpose of assisting with the costs of undocumented immigrants who are held in Nye County jails. Team, can you explain this a little bit as to why we're assisting with the costs associated with the incarceration of the undocumented immigrants, um, which are here on hold from the Marshal's office? So currently, the Sheriff's Office already takes care of undocumented immigrants. Mm -hmm. This particular program, again, helps reimburse the cost for Nye County to house and actually take care of them. So there's certain different officers within Nye County Sheriff's Office that are taking care of the immigrants. They do have to track their time specifically for this grant program, and then the state reimburses some of the funding. Okay, so this has nothing to do with them um, getting money from the U.S. Marshals Department. Yeah, don't, confuse it with, don't confuse it with ICE. Yeah. Total well, that's what I'm trying, to, yeah, I'm trying to see if, to make sure she's actually, there's not a confusion here. Yeah, that's exactly Okay, right. so yep, this is through the otherwise state. Otherwise, I would confuse them because I don't know if you're just talking about the jails or you're talking about the program that we have under the federal. Yep, this is just state program. It's not It's separate from the ICE federal program, yes. Okay. Now, commissioners. Aye. 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 Carboni's aye. Four of one. 
and we introduce you now to the new Clark County Manager. New Clark County Manager Kevin Schiller began his public service career in Washoe County and was instrumental in creating new ways to provide assistance to vulnerable children, adults, and families. I began in the human services field as a child protection worker and a juvenile probation officer. Worked my way up through the ranks, eventually becoming a director. I was in Washoe County for 20 plus years, uh, but my real focus was really around human services and that kind of led into uh, becoming a deputy county manager in Washoe County and working through various departments and realizing how everything kind of works together towards our uh, mission of public service. Mr. Schiller brought that expertise south to Clark County in 2017. Uh, was brought here really to focus in on human services, Department of Family Service, Social Service, and really a focus on how we can deliver that public service and bring it to the next level. My whole world has been about serving people, so I think that people skill interacting, uh, really appreciating what people do, uniqueness, diversity, both in management and both in trying to improve services has really been kind of my foundation and really kind of led me to where I am. Mr. Schiller praises the 10,000 Clark County employees who are on the front line, providing vital regional services to millions of residents and visitors. In the public service realm, the first is, you know, this is a massive organization and our employees are really um, where it all starts and where it all finishes. And as a regional service provider at the county level, we really don't get to say no. And so one focus is really on the employees, our Clark County family, and really focusing on employee wellness, how we can help them, give them the tools to deliver service, and really focusing moving ahead as we try to improve for our public. In 2020, the COVID pandemic forced the county to quickly develop innovative programs and services to deliver to its constituents. Mr. Schiller vows that Clark County government will continue that obligation. In terms of the recovery and the resilience on, on the public human services side, I think we are, are not peaked. I think we are still dealing with remnants of COVID in terms of how people live. So the economics um, is one side of that conversation. I think the other side, if you look at housing, rents, and you look at those things, I think that is probably the crisis that is still remaining. So I think that wave continues and that's something we really have to look at sustaining as we face challenges moving ahead. Earlier this year, the Board of County Commissioners allocated $120 million to the Welcome Home Community Housing Fund a groundbreaking initiative that puts at-risk residents into stable living situations. The Community Housing Fund is really focused on how we can take dollars to create flexibility for developers. So there's an economic development side of this to build housing, but also so we could get more units online quicker. We have to start somewhere and it's really the first of its kind um, in the state of Nevada. So I believe this will just continue to build momentum so we can um, increase our capacity. As Clark County enters into the new year, employees, residents, and visitors will see a new motto and rebrand of the state's largest local government. A reaffirmation of its commitment to proudly providing public service in the community. When we return, we're gonna tell you about a popular toy drive that occurred this weekend at Walmart. For watching News 25, brought to you by Mountain West Lawyer, Injury Attorneys, 727-9500. Also brought to you by Silver State Health. Visit silverstatehealth.org or call 702-471-0420 for an appointment. News 25, local news you can count on. Well, lots of toys were gathered over the past few months and now delivered to area residents on behalf of the PDAP Positive Prompt Toy Drive. So we are here for the 12th annual Positive Prompt Toy Drive. Um, we're doing great. Things are really good. Um, we've spent the, the whole week shopping with some of our early sponsors. And um, so we've been able to purchase uh, for more than 100 families prior to today. And then here today we've raised uh, just under a thousand dollars in cash and we've received hundreds of, of toy donations so we'll be uh, able to serve. It's going to be about 130 children total uh, that will be receiving gifts from us uh, tomorrow when we deliver. Uh, so this year we went uh, a couple of routes. So we always have people that send in their information and make a request. 
We also have get, gotten referrals from community organizations, and then this year the Division of Child and Family Services has uh, given us some foster families that we could assist as well. So we kind of have a combination this year of, of different sources. So Positive Brum, PDOP, and the Sheriff's Office have done this for several years now. Um, and so today here we obviously have some deputies and a lot of our Sheriff's Auxiliary volunteers that are helping and wrapping and shopping and, and wrapping some more. And then uh, tomorrow, likewise, uh, we'll be going out and we'll be escorting Santa uh, to make the actual deliveries. We'll be done today. Uh, if there's anyone that wants to donate after today, they should find uh, some of the various community organizations, no to abuse, uh, the Toys for Tots program. They, they do year-round collections. But we have our names selected before uh, Wednesday of this week, and then we actually shop for the children as we go. This has been months of collecting and wrapping. Uh, you can imagine the amount that goes into wrapping this many presents. Um, and, and obviously all of our sponsors that donated to the event um, really make it possible. So without, without those donations, we would not be able to do it. You can go to www.pdop.info or 702-516-0847. Well, you're not alone if you struggle to get a good night's sleep. Cleveland Clinic sleep specialist Michelle Drupp says about 30% of adults have symptoms of insomnia. So how long should it take the average person to fall asleep? Most people, if they don't have any sleep difficulties, probably fall asleep within 10 to 20 minutes. Um, it's varies, it varies as well. Um, you know, if it takes someone 45 minutes to fall asleep and that's normal for them and they allow enough time, it's not necessarily a problem. When it comes to getting quality sleep, what you eat and how often you exercise can play a big role. Dr. Drurup says eating a diet high in sugar, saturated fat, and processed carbohydrates can disrupt sleep. However, eating foods that are good for your overall health can help with your sleep. She also suggests that avoiding caffeine in the early afternoon is a good idea. Dr. Drarup adds that hitting the gym regularly can increase sleep quality and decrease the time it takes to fall asleep. Along with lifestyle changes, people try using white noise, like the sound of a fan, to wind down. She said a constant sound creates a masking effect to block out any other background noises. Above all, Dr. Drarup stresses it is crucial to avoid overthinking when trying to get some rest. If you think about someone who sleeps well, they probably don't think about sleep at all. They just listen to their body when they feel sleepy and that's when they go to bed, right? They don't have these rules or they don't have, you know, any real kind of thoughts about sleep. It's just, this is what I do. Um, when someone has sleep difficulties, they get anxious about sleep. They start to dread going to bed. And the more pressure you put, the harder you try to sleep, the least successful you're going to be. If someone has persistent issues with their sleep, the doctor encourages them to take notes of their sleeping patterns and talk to their health care provider. News 25 Weather Cam is brought to you by Lerner and Row Injury Attorney's Office in Pahrump. In a wreck, need a check? Call 702-877-1500. All right, taking a look at that beautiful sunset on the west side of town. We're going to have John here in just a moment tell us what's in store for our Christmas week. News 25 weather is brought to you by Dairy Council of Nevada. The splash of cream in your coffee, the dollop of sour cream on your burrito, the melted toasty cheese on your pizza. Undeniably delicious, undeniably dairy. Enjoy what's real. Hi, good evening, Nevada. This is John Kohler from the KPVM Channel 25 Weather Studios. Nice to see you on a Monday worldwide on the local BTV app. That's the app you need on your phone so you can take us with us, don't you know? Hey, let's take a look at Fernley and Fallon. Weather twins at 36 degrees. Uh, very nice. Carson City at 40. 34 out in Tonopah makes them the cool spot award winners. Uh, they just got out of freezing, just barely the freezing basement, didn't you? 39 out there in Goldfield, 52 in beautiful Beatty. Amargosa saw 54. That's the hot spot award winner. Vegas close behind at 52. And in Death Valley, 63 degrees. That's the day you want to take a picture of yourself in a sweater and go, eh, I needed it. It's out in Death Valley. But here in the Paradise of Prump, let's take a look. 46 degrees. That's our current temperature, 53 just a little bit earlier, I think that puts us in second place for the Hot Spot Award winners. Congratulations to us one and all. Uh, south southwesterly winds are just four miles per hour. Humidity kind of a nothing burger at 27%, but that sun rose this morning. 
and all its glory, hope, and promise at 6.50 a.m. Set this evening at 4.31. I don't know if we gained or lost any minutes. These are the shortest days of the year. And a happy birthday to my mom. I just remembered. It's the 19th. Uh, I better call her. Low tonight, 33 degrees. East, southeasterly winds at 3 miles per hour. And that humidity at 43%. It almost smells like rain, but maybe just some clouds. Yeah, maybe just some clouds on Tuesday. Let's call that good. Let's look at this week as we progress. Start at 56 degrees. End up with a weather trend all the way up to 66 degrees on Boxer Day. Christmas looking good at 65 with uh, sunshiny weather and um, beautiful stuff happening Christmas Eve, too, also with sunshine. It's going to be a gorgeous weekend. Looking forward to uh, seeing all the friends and uh, doing all the family and, and all of that, opening some presents. Maybe I was good. All right. Were you? Find out, I guess, soon. <laughs> all right, back to the desk. Here's Deanna. Looks like we're going to have some good temps there on Christmas Day. Well, that's going to wrap up this edition of News 25 from all of us here at KPVM-TV and East Country Radio. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.